take your Bible this evening, if you would, for our scripture reading. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 3, please. Matthew chapter 3. We're going to read the first six verses of Matthew chapter 3, reading responsibly as we normally do, begin together on verse 1, and we'll read alternately until we end on verse number 6. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, and let's begin together on verse 1 of John ch or Matthew chapter 3. Ready? In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, Make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, read six with me also, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture tonight. And Lord, I pray that once again, you would prepare us and make us ready to receive the truth from your word. Thank you for the good singing this evening, wonderful songs that we have to sing and praise to you, Lord. Thank you that we're saved by the blood, that we're on the winning side, uh, that blessed be the name of the Lord. It's just been good to be here this evening. We do pray your blessing now uh, upon the special as it's sung. And Lord, I pray that each of us would ask you to focus our attention and Lord, allow us to hear what the Spirit would say to each of our hearts tonight. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. There's a covenant sweet It was written for me it's a promise that I could be healed From all my sin and my shame Even heartache and pain It was signed and confirmed on a hill So I rest my case at the cross for now I have someone to champion my cause. I've been justified, satisfied, oh I have it all. So I rest my case at the cross. Don't feel sorry for me. When you see I'm in need, there's a judge who grants mercy and love. All my burdens he lifts, all my sin he forgives, every trial is won through the blood. So I rest my case at the cross for now i have someone to champion my cause i've been justified satisfied oh i have it all so i rest my case at the cross so i rest my case at the cross for now i have someone to champion my cause i've been justified satisfied oh i have it all so i rest my case at the cross. That's good. Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer now as we come to the preaching of your word. 
Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us, and thank you for being our God. Lord, we're here this evening now on a Sunday evening in May 2017, and we are asking you to speak to our hearts tonight. Folks have been faithful to be back in their place on Sunday evening, and Lord, we, we don't come just to say we went to church. We come to say we met with God tonight. And God spoke to my heart this evening. And so, Lord, uh, take the message this evening and use it in the hearts and lives of people. I pray, God, that you'll minister to each one as only you can do. And I'll thank you for what you will do, for I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, every so often, we have to just kind of preach a position message, I guess. And that tonight, I'm, I'm going to speak to you on why I'm a Baptist, okay? And, and why? You're in a Baptist church, okay? And, uh, you know, I, I grew up, obviously I grew up attending Baptist churches, not, not originally. My, my grandparents were Mennonite. Uh, in fact, I, probably their parents, I don't know for sure, uh, been, there might have been some Amish in there somewhere. And um, I remember at my grandmother's funeral in 1986, there were probably as many horse and buggies there as there were cars. Uh, and uh, that's the friends and the relatives and such that they had. And, but it was my father that broke away from the Mennonite church, and he actually began attending a church of the brethren um, there in, in Ohio, in Hartville. And uh, from there, he went to Milheim Baptist Church, and we started attending Baptist Church from that time on. And of course, as I got older, I, when I went away to Bible college, the first Bible college I went to was a non-denominational college and uh, other, other denominations present. And so I had to begin to examine for myself and uh, study to show myself approved unto God and to see what is it that I believe, uh, what is it that I really hold to. And so I, I understand, I want you to know tonight, I'm a Baptist by conviction. I'm not a Baptist by convenience, not because it's closest church to my house, okay? Some of you understand that. You drive by many churches to get to this one, and uh, you're not a Baptist by convenience. I, I'm not a Baptist because of friendships, because, well, my, I like all the people there. I got friends there. I hope you have friends at church. That's a good place to have them, but that's not a reason to go to a church, okay? You ought to go to church and be, uh, be where you are by conviction. Now, I want you to agree with this statement, and here's what I came to the conclusion, is that if, I, if you cannot find it in the Bible, it is not Baptist doctrine. And if, you, if it is Baptist doctrine, you will find it in the Bible. Okay, do you understand? <clears throat> when, when God would send a man to prepare the people to get ready for the Lord Jesus coming, and for the Lord Jesus' ministry. He chose a man named John. In fact, you remember the story with uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth when you know, they, they, they came out. Zacharias couldn't talk. You know, uh, He wrote things for nine months. And uh, when, when finally John was born, they wanted to know what his name would be. And, and of course, they all thought it would be Zach Jr. You know, and uh, he would just be a, a carry on the line. And he wrote... Uh, mom said, no, his name's going to be John. And they, they got his father and said, surely he'll want to call him his namesake, you know. And he wrote down, no, his name will be John. And that's what they knew he was going to be called. And so his name was John. But when, notice in Matthew chapter 3, if you have your Bible open where we read tonight, here's what the Bible says. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Now, now, wait a minute. He, he isn't called Baptist because he baptized people. At this point, he hadn't baptized anybody. He hadn't even preached a sermon yet. So here, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, what does God call John? A Baptist. That's exactly... Listen, his parents didn't name him that. The people didn't name him that. Who named him that? God did. God called him John the Baptist. And he hadn't preached a sermon yet. He'd simply been called by God 
Baptist, and I think because of the work and the mission that God would have him to do. Um, look at John chapter 4 and verse 1. John chapter 4 and verse 1. In John 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard... Bill, what's the, what are those set on? It's really warm. I'm burning up. So uh, get some cool air moving in here, will you? So, John 4, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than who? Than John. Though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. Notice the mission, make and baptize disciples. That's was, that was the mission of the Lord Jesus, make and baptize disciples. That was also the mission of John, make and baptize disciples. Well, wait a minute, what's our mission? Make and baptize disciples. Uh, see, the mission continues from John to Jesus to us. It hasn't changed. We're continuing the same uh, mission that started with John and continued with Jesus. Now, we're still on the mission of saving souls and baptizing only saved individuals. Okay? That's important. And, and you have to remember that. Now, you have to understand then, listen, so John was a Baptist, called so by God. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Matthew wrote, he's John the Baptist. <clears throat> Jesus traveled 60 miles. Now, that's nothing for us, but that's something in their day. He traveled 60 miles to the Jordan River so he could be baptized by a Baptist preacher. Pretty impressive. Pretty important. He was, he, he, it, it, you think we're hard-nosed about getting baptized. I've never had anybody travel 60 miles just to get baptized by the Baptist preacher. Baptism, because listen, baptism is always by immersion in water. Say, well, I was sprinkled. Well, you were sprinkled. That's what it is. It's not baptism. You know, I got water poured on my head, and you got water poured on your head. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not making fun of that. I'm just saying that's not Bible baptism. Bible baptism always pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you can't get that with any other kind except being buried in the likeness of his death and being raised in the likeness of his resurrection. It's always that way uh, in the Bible. Now, <clears throat> there are certain Baptist distinctives that we hold to. Listen, uh, some may hold to many of these that we'll talk about tonight. And many may hold to some of those, some of these. But Baptists hold to all of these. And so, if you want to take some notes, it, it spells the word Baptist out, okay? And we're just going to give these to you. And it uh, might be a good thing for you to kind of carry around in your Bible and just have them. But here they are, and I won't spend a long time on each one. Uh, it, it, we'll just kind of hit them and, and keep moving, all right? B. Baptist, plus it'll help you to spell Baptist now. You know, you know how many times I say people write down Baptist and they B-A-B-T-I, I say not Baptist, Baptist with a P, all right? But um, here is B stands for biblical authority. Biblical authority. 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Okay? So the final authority, we, we say the Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. We go by the Word of God alone. Period. We don't go by a council. Well, the Council of Trent, or the Council of this time, of 38 B.C., you know, we, we don't go by any council. We don't go by any creed. We're not going by denomination. We're not going by headquarters. We're going by the Word of God. We're going by the Bible. We believe in salvation by grace through faith alone. Why? The Bible teaches that. 
We believe in the eternal security of the believer. You say, oh, you believe once you're saved, you're always saved? No, I believe the Bible. And the Bible believes you're once you're saved, you're always saved. And the Bible teaches that. Uh, we, we believe in heaven because the Bible tells us there's a heaven. We believe in hell because the Bible says there's a hell. We don't believe there's a purgatory because the Bible doesn't talk about purgatory. We don't baptize babies because the Bible doesn't baptize a baby. You won't find that anywhere in Scripture. And so the Bible is the final authority. And, and think about this now. Here's, here's John, who was a Baptist, and the followers, he baptized Jesus. And then those who, some followed John, and if they're following a Baptist preacher, what does that make them? A Baptist. And they're following him. You know, eight men wrote the New Testament. And they were all Baptist. Boy, that's quiet. Think about it. Just think about it. Don't, uh, it, 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 we're, we're <laughs> I don't need, and by the way, we don't need any supplements. We don't need any, anything addition to. We, this is our book. There's no other book. Other religions sometimes have to have other books in order to, to, to practice what they believe. We just have the book. It's the Bible. It's the Word of God. Um, we, we, we're, we're going to follow God's Word. We, whatever the Bible says, that's what we do. Again, if it's Baptist doctrine, you'll find it in the Bible. And if you'll find it in the Bible, it's Baptist doctrine. Okay? Understand that. You say, well, what about praying to Mary? You find it in here for me. See? What about burning candles for the dead? Find it in here for me. See? Uh, uh, you, you, can't, you can't go. What about getting baptized for dead people? Find it in here for me. See, it's not in the Bible. Okay? The Bible is our final authority. All right? That's, that's, uh, that's B. A. B. A. A is autonomy of the local church. The autonomy of of the local church it autonomy means the the self-rule of the local church okay ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 22 ephesians chapter 1 verse number 22 the bible says this and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Who's he talking about? Jesus Christ. Who's the head of the church? Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And, and so we are the head of the church is Jesus Christ. We are accountable to him. We are responsible to him. He dominates the Baptist church just like your head dominates you. Okay? Okay. If you don't let your head dominate you, you're in trouble. Try, try walking. Try having your head look this way and you walk that way. Bad things are going to happen. Okay? You've got to follow your head. And that's not true of any other church in the world. John Wesley is the head and the founder of the Methodist church. John Calvin is the head and the founder of the Presbyterian church. Henry VIII is the head and the founder of the Episcopal Church. Constantine is the head and the founder of the Catholic Church. Joseph Smith is the head and founder of the Mormon Church. The only church of which Jesus is the head and founder of is the Baptist Church. That mark differentiates the Baptist from all the other churches. They, they go back to 1500s, and I'll, I'll make render at this later, but they go back to the 1500s, most of them, the Catholic Church to around 300s. But they, the other ones were all called Protestant churches. Baptists are not Protestants. Amen. We didn't begin in 1500 when Luther came out of the Catholic Church and posted his theses and then all the other groups. And, and by the way, he came out protesting and that's where they get the idea of Protestant. That's why Methodists are Protestant, Presbyterians are Protestants. And Episcopalians are Protestants, and, and, and Lutherans are Protestant. That's why sometimes you go into Lutheran church, you go into some Presbyterian churches, it reminds you of a Catholic church. Because that's, they came from Mama. They came out from them. Now, Luther came out saying, I believe in salvation by grace through faith, and I'm glad. That's fine. That's wonderful. 
But you see, he still carried baggage with him. Luther still believed you should baptize babies. Where'd that come from? It came from the Catholic Church. There's still some other beliefs, that baggage that came along with them. And, and, and you bring those ideas out that aren't in the Bible. So, <clears throat> hey, when you go to the hospital and they say, uh, are, you, are you Catholic or Protestant? You say, neither. I'm Baptist. Now, they'll look at you and scratch their head, but you say, well, Baptists aren't Protestants. They probably won't want to hear the story, but that's okay. Just, just let them know that you understand the difference. All right? So we have the autonomy of the local church. So the rule of the local church is he's the head, and we follow what he says. We don't follow anything else or anyone else. Okay? B-A-P is priesthood of the believer. We believe in the priesthood of the believer. That's Hebrews 4 and verse number 16. Hebrews 4 and verse 16. Let's look at that verse together, shall we? The Bible says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Well, the verse is telling us there, Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. What that verse is telling us, what we believe when we say the priesthood of the believer. How many understand the Old Testament? When, when the Old Testament priest would go into the presence of God. It was a place in the temple, not where they offered sacrifices, but where they went behind the veil of the temple into a place called the Holy of Holies, where the mercy seat was, and they would sprinkle the blood on that mercy seat, and, and God would accept the sacrifice for the, for the sins of the people. The high priest could only enter into that holy place where the presence of God was one time a year. And he would do that for the atonement of the sins of the people. When Jesus died on the cross, that veil, it's about an 8 to 12 inch thick veil. That's a pretty thick piece of material. And, and that was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Remember when Christ died, there was an earthquake? And, and, and when, that, when, when he died, that veil rent in two from the top to the bottom. I understand the religious leaders that they tried to sew that thing back up and they could not do it. There was no way for them to get it, get it sewed up. They tried. But that was all broken down. Why? Now, it's not a high priest that has to go into the presence of God. We all can go into the presence of God. I want to tell you something tonight. The pastor has no more access to God than you do. We believe in the priesthood of the believer. That means, that means you don't have to come confess any sins to me. Hallelujah. And uh, I, don't, I don't want to hear your sins, okay? And um, I got enough just listen to my wife's. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, boy, now I'm in trouble now, huh? And uh, she's out. She didn't hear that. So um, listen, but, you don't, but seriously, you don't confess your sin to any man. You why? You go right to God. Now, I'm happy to pray with you, but don't think that my prayers carry more weight than yours do. You have equal access to God. See, we all have, that's the priesthood of the believer. You don't have to come and, there's one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. He's our intercessor. We all have the same intercessor, Jesus Christ. And by Him, we have access to the Father. And all of us have equal access to God. All right? And so, you don't have to pray to man. You don't have to pray to Mary either. And again, nowhere in the Bible. Does that happen? And there's, that would make her another intercessor besides Jesus. And there's no other intercessor but Jesus Christ. There's only one. That's, all right? So that's our, that's our priesthood of the believer. Then we come to T. B-A-P-T. T is two ordinances. Two ordinances. There are two ordinances instituted by the Lord, initiated by the Lord Jesus, and then given to the church to carry on. Okay? Those two ordinances are baptism, and the Lord's table. And it's amazing how Satan has gone after both of those to, to confuse people and get people messed up on what they really mean. We know that baptism always follows salvation. Uh, we had the class on baptism this evening in the 530 class. And, you know, it, it, I was telling them how oftentimes with children, you know, they come on the bus or whatever, and you can, take a, you can go home and say, hey, uh, Johnny here, accepted Jesus as a Savior. And the parents say, oh, that's nice. But you go home and say, Johnny got baptized today. And they'll say, what? What did you do? Boy, to them, baptism's the big thing. 
when baptism is the big thing, salvation is the big thing. Amen. And that's they got saved, you know. But, and that's why, by the way, but people understand. You know why? Satan has got them to believe that baptism takes away their sin. That being sprinkled as a baby is the big deal. That's why sometimes when you start witnessing to somebody and start talking to them about salvation, they'll bring up how they were baptized. See, they believe that was the big deal. And that's not the, it's a big deal, but it's not salvation. It's obedience to the Lord. It always comes after salvation. And it is always showing people outwardly what you believe in your heart. Salvation is a heart decision. You believe in your heart. With the heart man believes unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. So it's a heart. But listen, nobody can see your heart. We can't see each other's heart. So we have to have some outward way to show that we, we believed in Christ. And that's baptism. You stand in the baptistry and you get baptized. People here say, oh, they've trusted Jesus as their Savior. And they believe that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again for them. And they're not ashamed to let people know that. See, uh, doesn't the Bible say, whosoever believes on him should not be ashamed? And so baptism is just letting people know, I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ, and I want to be obedient to him. Jesus was baptized. Why? Did he have to wash away his sin? <laughs> no, he didn't have any. Baptized an example to us. We should follow his steps, see, and be baptized in obedience to what the Lord wants us to do. And John the Baptist we saw baptized. The disciples of Jesus baptized. Peter baptized. Paul baptized. And it went right on down through the New Testament church. And we still baptize folks after they believe in Jesus. Then the Lord's table. And again, you, you read about this in 1 Corinthians 11. Jesus started it in the Gospels. Paul gave instructions in 1 Corinthians 11. He said, as often as you do it, you show the Lord's death till he comes. Okay? It's a way for us to remember what Jesus did for us. We don't, we don't, you know, nowadays when you want to remember a vacation or you want to remember somebody, you'll take out pictures and look at them. Or you take out your phone and look at them in the pictures. You know, it used to be you had an album, you know. I don't know if people have those anymore, but uh, you, 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 we, we go through pictures or videos or, and we watch things and we remember events we remember people remember vacations and we'll relive those okay well you don't have that for the death of christ so god gave us the lord's table and and the elements of the lord's table are symbolic of the body and the blood of jesus there's no there's no saving power in the elements they're just symbolic the the bread is unleavened because the, the leaven is a picture of sin and there's no sin in the body of Jesus, and so the bread is unleavened bread. The same thing why there's grape juice and not wine. Wine would be fermented. Wine would have leaven in it. would mean there was sin in the body of Christ. There's no sin in the body of Christ. And so it's, it's unfermented wine. It's grape juice, and, and they're symbolic. When you take the elements, the bread and the juice, you're not receiving Christ. You are simply receiving the elements. In reminding you what Jesus did for you when he died on the cross. That's the Lord's table. Okay? And there's strict, strict commandments there about being careful, about taking it unworthily, taking it. It's a table of fellowship with the Lord. And, and we're, we're reminded to do it as often as we do it in remembrance of him. That's for the church. Baptism is to be done under the authority of a local church. The Lord's table is to be administered under the authority of the local church. Jesus gave it to the church, and the church administers that. We, we believe in two ordinances. Then I, B-A-P-T-I, I stands for individual liberty. Look at Romans 14. Would you go there, please? Romans chapter 14. Individual liberty. Romans 14. Look with me at verse number 5. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. He that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth 
eateth to the Lord, and he giveth God thanks. He that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. None of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. As it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Okay? Liberty. Here he's talking about liberty to do as your conscience dictates you to do. As, your, as your, this puts it, as you're persuaded in your own mind to do. Now, that is obviously based on how God has convicted you from His Word. What He's talking about here is observing certain days or uh, uh, eating certain things or not eating certain things. How many of you know, how many of you know believers who, who don't think you ought to celebrate Christmas? Anybody know believers like that? Look at that. How many know believers who don't, don't celebrate Easter at all? Okay. See, some people think this is a day to celebrate. Other people think just another day. You know what the Bible says? Let them do it. Don't, don't look at somebody who says that and say, man, what, what kind of nut are you? But by the same token, don't look at somebody who celebrates and says, what kind of pagan are you? Everybody be fully persuaded in their own mind. And we allow for that liberty to disagree. It's okay. You don't have to see eye to eye with me on everything. You can be wrong. <laughs> That's how we feel, isn't it? Huh? That's how we think. No. We have, we have liberty to be. You know what? One day we'll stand before God and he'll iron it all out. We'll all give an account to God. And, and I doubt that, that that, again, you've heard me say this before, that, that chair in heaven that sits there and there's a sign above it that says 100% right about everything. No one's going to sit in that chair. Okay? Because none of us are 100% right about everything. We want to believe we are. But we may get to heaven and I think we're going to be surprised about some things. We're going to say, oh man. That, that really didn't matter? <laughs> Or, wow, that was important, and I didn't think that was important. But we, we, we have to allow each other that, that liberty. There's certain things that you may be convicted about because of your life and what the Lord has done in your life that may not be a problem for somebody else. Years ago, we hadn't, we hadn't been pastoring very long, and we had an activity, a church activity. We, weren't, we had started the church, so we weren't real big, and we thought we'd just all go bowling. And I remember having a couple come to me, and this is back in the days when bowling alleys were filled with smoke and, you know, everything else they could smoke and all that. And so they came and they said, we're not going to go bowling. I said, oh, man, what, what's wrong with bowling? And they said, well, you know, before we got saved, we used to be big bowlers. And that was where we smoked and we drank, and it just wouldn't be good for us to go back in that environment. We just don't think that's for us. Okay. I understand that. Don't go. And, and I didn't think less of them, but they weren't condemning us for going bowling. See, they didn't take the stand. Oh, bless God, bowling alley. You know, you're going to hell if you're in, you know, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Just say, hey, that's not, not something I should do. I, I shouldn't be a part of that because of how it's going to affect me. And I don't want to be a part of that. I, okay, the, the, the group here this morning. And they're, they're a wonderful group. Wonderful folks. The laymans have been in here several times, and, and they, 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 they say sometimes we have to go out to Colorado. They did put a visitor's card in. I think I need to go visit some of them. But um, they, um, they you, you can arrange that, can't you? And uh, round trip, not one way, okay? But um, <laughs> I know what some of you are thinking. I know what the deacons were thinking, Brother Cato. They're saying, all right, here's our chance. But, um, you know, he noticed when we, were, when we were saying about having them sing. And uh, he said uh, that some of the music is canned. And he knows that we don't use canned music. Now, I've never said that that I know of. 
when he's been here, but he's just observed by being here that we use people that are here. Now, I don't think someone who's using canned music is sinning against God. Okay? And uh, I, I don't, we just, that is, that is my choice as the pastor here that we just don't use it. Okay? I, there, there's a myriad of reasons. If you want to know them, I'll sit down and discuss it with you and tell you uh, what they are. But, but we just don't do it. And uh, I, we, we use the people that are here and allow them to use the talents God's given to them. And uh, I think that's the way it should be. But I don't, I, I'm not going to preach against somebody who wants to use that. Okay? That's, that's strictly between them and God. If they think it's okay, that, that's okay. Let them answer to God for that. I'll answer to God for not using it. And uh, I'm going to make it to heaven one day, and God will say, hey, that was no big deal. What are you making to stink about that for? And I'll say, okay, I, I, I missed that one. And, uh, but that's, that's what I believe. And so we have individual soul liberty. Um, you know, in fact, brother, I, I told him, Brother Cato, he's in that same group that, in fact, he's, it's his fault. He got me into this group on Facebook. It's a bunch of preachers, and they, they call it the steam room because preachers have let off their steam in there. You know what I mean? And, uh, but one guy, I had one post where the guy said he was at the camp meeting and he heard a sermon against polo shirts and tennis shoes and wire rim glasses and everything. You know what I mean? And nothing biblical, just stuff guys preaching about everything. You know, there was no Bible with it at all. And uh, because, again, when we get into those things, we're, we're missing that we're allowed to have liberty. Okay? So don't, don't, don't get to judging anybody else. What, you know why? Because we're going to all stand before God. You're not answerable to me. You'll be answerable to God one day. And so will I. So if you want to celebrate Christmas, celebrate Christmas. If you don't want to celebrate Christmas, don't. But don't criticize the one who does. Don't, don't get upset with someone who wants to do it. And uh, just uh, some people esteem every day alike. Some people celebrate a certain day. Some people make big deals about birthdays. Other people just make birthdays another day. Big deal. But that, that's okay. Let everyone be fully persuaded in his own mind. Individual soul liberty, all right? Then let's go to the next S. This is, is a saved and baptized membership. Saved and baptized membership. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. All right? <clears throat> saved. Teach. Teach is to make disciples of all nations. Teach them how to be saved. Then baptize them. Then teach them to observe all things which I have commanded you. That's the great commission. Okay? Is to, to get people saved, see them baptized, and teach them. And, and they were, in Acts 2.41, when they were saved and then baptized, they were added to the church. They were added unto them. Who's them? It has to be the people in the upper room. It has to be the 120 that were already believers. That they're added to them, uh, those who were saved and baptized. Webster defines Baptists as this. Christians, Christians who deny the validity of infant baptism and of sprinkling and maintain that baptism should be administered to believers alone and should be by immersion. It's not a Baptist defining that. That's Webster defining Baptist. Okay? And that's exactly right. It's, we, don't, we don't baptize people unless they make a clear profession that their faith is in Jesus Christ as their Savior. We only have a saved and baptized membership. Nobody come, when somebody comes forward and they want to join the church, first question they're going to be asked is, when were you saved? Tell me your testimony. Then have you been baptized since you've been saved? Okay? And they talk about when they get baptized. And then they can become a member. Okay? If they're not baptized, they'll get baptized. And then they'll become a member. You're saved, baptized, and you belong. Okay? That's, that's, uh, uh, does every church say you have to be saved and baptized to belong? No. No. They, sadly, they don't. And so it's a distinguishing name. It's a, it's a differentiating name, Baptist. If it means we baptized, save people. And, and, and it differentiates us from those who do not. 
Okay, they accept members into the membership and uh, do not are not concerned about whether they're saved or not. You run into them all the time when you knock on doors and you witness to people. Oh yeah, I go to such and such church. I go to this church, but they're not saved. They never received Christ as their Savior, and so they're not they're they're, they're members, but they're not saved. Okay, so we have a saved and a baptized membership. Then T is two offices. <clears throat> First Timothy chapter three. First Timothy chapter three. First Timothy three. Paul deals with Timothy here and the two offices of the church. Notice he says, first of all, in verse one, that's a true saying: If a man desire the office of a bishop. He desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. And it goes on and lists the qualifications given for a bishop or for a pastor. Then notice down in verse 8. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these first be proved. Let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. And the deacons should be the husband of one wife as well, ruling their children and their own house as well. So we find out there's two offices given in the local church. There's the office of the pastor and the office of deacon. Okay? Those are the two scriptural offices. We believe that, that the word here for bishop is overseer. Another place, the Bible calls it an elder. He tells Titus to ordain elders in every city. Those are pastors. And the word, pa the word pastor simply means shepherd, someone who cares for the flock. Bishop is an overseer, one who oversees the work. An elder has to do more with the spiritual maturity of the person. That's why he said for the pastor here in verse number 6 of 1 Timothy 3, not a novice, not a new Christian, but someone who's been saved a while. Because if he's a novice, he'll be lifted up with pride and fall into the condemnation of the devil. So don't be careful about the spiritual maturity of a person. And a person can be saved a long time but not be spiritually mature. A spiritual maturity doesn't necessarily equate to how long you've been a Christian. I know some folks have been saved a long time, and they're still pretty much babies when it comes to their spirituality. That's sad, but it's true. And, it's, uh, and, and so you want to make sure that's, that's why when it says the husband of one wife for a pastor, the, the wives of the deacons, that means there's no women pastors. And there's no women deacons. See? Now, does that mean they don't serve? No. Uh, women thankfully serve in the church. Thankful for the women who serve in this church. But we don't have deaconesses. Okay? We just, they're just servants. And, and, and they serve in the church. So there's not a, in a Baptist church, there's not a elder board or a ruling board or, or any, anything like that, you say, well, I know this group has that. Other groups will have that. But Baptists don't have that. Okay? Because go back to point number one. Biblical authority. The Bible's the authority. The Bible's our book. The Bible's our guideline. And, and we follow that. The <clears throat> it's it's the, the, the leadership of the, the pastor, the bishop, the elder. Years ago, uh, it was our first missions conference, actually, uh, 2006. Um, the church called us in October of 2005, and it was September of 2006. And you remember the Richardsons, the other Steve and them were in our first missions conference. They were going to start the church down in Minnie, Kentucky. And they wanted, they, one of the needs they had as a new church startup was songbooks. And I felt like, Though we were still pretty small, I thought we ought to try to get them songbooks. Uh, we could get the songbooks we're using uh, for ten dollars. So well, fifty books, fifty books, ten dollars a piece, five hundred dollars. And uh, and the Lord really seemed to impress Mark. That's something that we we should do. And so I got up and we announced that we should collect 
money, $500, and get them 50 songbooks. And, amen, everybody seemed to be in agreement. And, and within two weeks, just two Sundays, we had the $500. Ordered the books and got them to them. And by the way, that was a lot of money for us in those days. <laughs> it really was amazing. And uh, it was great. But I had somebody get upset with that. Wrote me a letter. Saying, I don't think one man ought to decide what we spend our money on. I think we ought to have a committee that makes those decisions. And, and I was nice. I'm always nice. And uh, <laughs> why are you laughing? But, uh, and, and I said, I just said, listen, I, if you're looking for a committee-run church, you're in the wrong church. This church will not be run by committee. This church will be led by the pastor. Now, and I'm not, I'm not asking, I didn't get up and say, hey, let's give him $10,000. You know, he would have shot me. But, uh, and I'm not going to do something like, like that. You see, and, and by the way, if I ever had something like that, we've got good enough men here would say, preacher, sit down, you need a pill. You know, <laughs> you, you, got, you, got, you got some issues going on here. Uh, we don't, uh, that would keep, keep the pastor, you know, grounded. And by the way, that leads you to the deacons, Okay. The deacons are there, that's the other office, two offices, pastor and deacons, and the deacons are there to serve the church. The first deacons came about in Acts chapter 6 when some widows were being neglected in the daily, they were taking daily taking care of the widows. By the way, that's the way it always was. The church took care of folks. Because, by the way, why could, how could they take care of folks? Because people were in church. Nobody expected the government to take care of them. Their church family took care of them because they were in church. When folks left the church, they left the care of the church. And you don't realize what happens when you decide to leave the church of God. You lose a lot when you do that. And, and so they don't get cared for. And so they, they were being neglected. And the apostle says, Choose out from among you seven men of honest report. And it gives the qualifications there for deacons as well. Full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. And they chose seven deacons. And what was their primary responsibility? To take, to take food to the widows. Why? So the apostles said, so we can give ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. We want to give ourselves to prayer and the word of God. And so the deacons' responsibility is to serve the congregation to make sure the pastor can give himself to prayer and the word of God. Can the pastor mow the churchyard? Sure. But the pastor mows the churchyard and cleans the restrooms and takes care of the auditorium and cleans everything else up, you're going to get up on Sunday and you're going to know he didn't do much time in the word this week. Hmm? If we didn't have, you would not get, uh, I, I hope you know that I don't just throw something together when I get up to preach. I hope, I hope you can tell that, that there's some preparation that goes into these messages. But I couldn't do that if I didn't have men in this church that take care of things throughout the week so that I can give myself to prayer and the study of the Word of God. And, I've got to, and, and we've got men that do that. See, And by the way, you don't have to have the title of deacon to do that. See, Don't seek a position. Just seek to serve. Just be a servant. And, and, and those are the two. It, this idea where deacons run the church, that's not in the Bible. Deacons were servants. And they're just here to serve to free up the hands of the pastor. And then the last S, Baptists, is soul winning and separation are essential. Soul winning and separation are essential. That's what Baptists believe. I, should, I could almost preface this and say that's what independent Baptists believe. Matthew 28, we talked about the Great Commission. Those are the marching orders of the church. That's what we go by. It's the royal command of God that we're to go and preach the gospel. One thing that ought to be continually being replenished is the tracks downstairs. Those ought to constantly be going out. Why? Because people ought to be taking them every service and then passing them out. They're not to collect in the, in the glove box of your car. They're not to stack up in your purse. Ladies. 
Got to make that clear these days, I guess. You see, we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. All of us are to be giving the gospel to other people. Be ye reconciled to God. That's what He saved us for. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Would you turn there? We're almost done. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You're familiar with verse 17, are you not? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But wait, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ. And then He hath given to us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. To wit, God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. We're, we've got the word of reconciliation. We're to go into all the world and tell them you can be reconciled to God. First of all, they have to know you're away from God. We're all sinners and we've fallen short of the glory of God and the way to come back to God. We all have that ministry. That, that's not just for a select few. That's everybody's ministry. Everybody's to be giving the gospel. Everybody's to be a soul winner. That's not a gift. That's a command to obey. Everybody ought to be witnessing to others. And then we have separation. Go past 2 Corinthians to Galatians. Galatians chapter 6. Paul said this, verse 14, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Paul said, I, I'm going to glory in the cross and I'm going to take that cross and I'm going to be crucified. The world's going to be crucified to me and I'm going to be crucified to the world. I'm going to be dead to the things of the world and I want the, by the way, the world will be dead to me. Hey, you know what dead things do? Dead things stink. You've, you've, you've probably walked into your house before at one time or another in your, your years of living and, and said, man, Something dying here? If you ever had anything die, you, you, you know what it, it stinks. And you don't say, oh well, that's okay. No, you're going to find it and get rid of it. You don't, my, I, I don't want to be, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, please understand, my, my grandfather, um, when I was 21, one month before we were getting married, my grandfather and my grandmother lived in our house. We moved them in with us. My grandfather was laying on the couch, taking a nap. And I remember I was working midnights during that time. And so I was sleeping. It was in the afternoon. I hadn't gotten up yet. And my mom's yelling up top of the steps for me to wake up. And I got up and I come to the top of the steps. She goes, I can't wake Pop. That's what we call Grandpa, Pop. Can't wake Pop up. And went downstairs and he was in heaven. He had been reading a commentary on Revelation. And it was laid across his chest. And he was gone. I guess he was reading about it and decided, I guess I'll go there. <laughs> huh? And he went to heaven. Just that easy. And, and listen, we didn't say, well, let's just leave him there for a while. <laughs> and I'm not trying to be disrespectful at all. But no, we know when something's dead, we have to go take care of it. And it goes to the funeral home and they take care of the body and then we bury it in the ground. See, hey, Paul said, the world's crucified to me, and I am to the world. That means the things of this world ought to stink to me. I'm not going to be attracted by the things of the world. You know, the older I get, the more, I, the more you grow in Christ, the less attraction the things of the world have. The more, you know what, the closer you get to Christ, the less you don't care who dances with the stars. You don't care who's on American Idol. You don't care whether the Grammys or the Emmys or the Hoochies are on. It doesn't matter. Who cares? It's the, and by the way, I'm crucified to the world. 
they think I stink. This Christianity where the world thinks, oh, Christians are really cool, that's not found in the Bible. This world and the religious people of this world crucified Jesus. Jesus said, marvel not if they hated me. What are they going to do to you? They're going to hate you if you remind them of me. See? And Baptists believe traditionally, and we've always believed that the friendship with the world is enmity with God. And so we've always been separate. We always have marched to the, the beat of a different drummer. We don't want to be like the world or look like the world or smell like the world or act like the world. That's why we don't bring the world into our church. When you come here, you know it's Christian music. You know it's godly music. You know you're in church. You're not, you're not mistaking it for a concert of some kind. Okay? It's, it's, we're not bringing the world in. We're going to be separate from the world. That's always been the case. Separation. Soul winning and separation. Now, I said before, we're, we're Baptists. We're not Protestant. And A.T. Robertson, who's a famous scholar, said this, that given an, a new heart and an open Bible, people will become Baptists. I. N. Yohanan, a Persian, got saved under a Presbyterian missionary. He read the New Testament and traveled to New York so he could be baptized by a Baptist preacher. Spurgeon said he was reading the Bible one day and discovered that he was a Baptist. At 15, Spurgeon broke with his family tradition by becoming a Baptist. Of course, most of you know his conversion was he was searching and it was a snowstorm in England and the church he normally would go to wasn't having services and he went down the street trying to find somebody that was having church. And he, he happened to get into a primitive Methodist chapel where according to his own testimony there were just a handful of people there. The pastor couldn't make it because of the snowstorm. And one of the deacons just stood up and gave a message from Isaiah 45 verse 22. Look unto me uh, and be ye saved all ye ends of the earth. And he just told him to look unto me, look unto Christ and be saved. And of course just a handful there but he looked down and said young man if you look to Jesus he'll save you. Spurgeon got saved that night. And within four months after reading his Bible, after salvation, he was baptized and joined a Baptist church. Adoniram Judson received Christ in 1808 at 20 years of age. Think about this now. On February 3rd in 1812, four years later, he took leave of his parents. On February 5th, he was united in marriage to Anne Hazeltine. The next day, February 6th, he was ordained at Salem. And two weeks later, on February 19th, with his bride, he embarked on the ship called Caravan and bound, was bound for Calcutta, India as a missionary. Four months it took them to, to go from the East Coast to Calcutta, India. During this time, they studied their Bibles. And they decided on the ship, as they studied, that they'd accept the tenets of the Baptist faith because they'd been led to believe by reading the Bible that faith should precede baptism and that baptism was only by immersion. Now that cost them a great struggle because that meant they're casting aside all their previous training. And the board that sent them would drop them from support. There's no, and there's no Baptist mission board at all at that time. So they were forsaking all their support. But it was a step of faith and it was a step of deep conviction. On September 6, 1812, when they landed in Calcutta, he and his wife were baptized by a Pastor Ward in Calcutta. When news got back to America of their change, of course, the board dropped them like they thought they would. But the Baptists, the quote, the Baptists were aroused and organized the American Baptist Missionary Union and took them on for support. You see, I'm a Baptist. And now you know why. Okay? 
a lady walked out of church when the service was over. Maybe it's a church similar to this, service similar to this. And she commented this. She said, I never wanted to be labeled, but tonight I found out I'm a Baptist. Okay? And by the way, it's not a bad label. Okay? I think, I think, I think when you, I think you ought to be what you are. That's why we, we put on the sign what we are. We're Bible Baptist Church. We're not bringing you in under false pretenses. Okay? We're going to tell you this is what we are. Yeah, this, is what, this is what we believe. And, and I think you ought to be a Baptist. And I ought to be one by conviction. And this is, this, is, this is what we believe. This is why we believe it. I hope you understand. I hope it helped you to know why you are in a Baptist church. And I hope you'll be one, not by convenience or not by preference, but by conviction. Let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for our Baptist heritage, our Baptist faith. Lord, I, I realize that I want to thank you for my dad who's in heaven with you ten years ago. Thank you, Lord, that he listened to you as a young man with young children when he took us to a Baptist church. Shaped my life. Wouldn't be where I am now if it weren't for that. And Lord, tonight I pray that there would be some moms and dads, there will be some boys and girls who would just say I'm I'm thankful I'm in a Baptist church. And now I know why I'm in a Baptist church. Maybe some children would say, I thank God that I get to be brought up in a Baptist church. Maybe others tonight have not been sure why they're in a Baptist church. Maybe they've just always been because their family was, but maybe tonight you spoke to their heart and they say, I now I'm a Baptist, not because my family was, but because I know what Baptists believe. And it's what I believe. And I'm a Baptist by conviction. Lord, speak to hearts tonight as only you can do. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm going to finish praying in just a moment. I wonder how many folks tonight have just say, Preacher, you know, I've, I've been a Baptist. I've gone to Baptist churches. But I, I could never really say I'm a Baptist by conviction. I, I just never been able to say that but tonight I learned something the Lord spoke to my heart about some things and I found out tonight I'm I'm a Baptist by conviction because of what the Bible says preacher God has helped me this evening he's spoken to my heart here's my hand indicating that and pray for me this evening would you slip your hand up amen amen well that's good wonderful you may put them down you hear tonight and would say, Pastor, I don't know if, if I died, I'd go to heaven. I'm not sure I'm saved. Say, so you got to be a saved, baptized membership. I, I'm not sure I'm a Christian. Maybe you'd say, Night, Pastor, pray for me this evening. Would you slip your hand up and put it back down that I'd see it? Is there anybody like that? Say, I'm not sure that I'm saved. You hear tonight would say, Well, I'm saved, but, Pastor, I've not been baptized yet. I haven't made that step of obedience. And I appreciate you praying for me. Would you pray for me tonight? Would you slip your hand up and put it back down? Say, Pastor, pray for me tonight. God bless you. Anybody else? Say, Pastor, pray for me. Maybe you're here tonight and say, Pastor, I'm saved and I'm baptized. And we're not a member of Bible Baptist Church, but I appreciate you praying with us about that. We're really asking God whether he'd have us become members. Would, would, would you say, Pastor, pray with us about that? Would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me? God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. In a moment, I'll pray, and we'll have our invitation. The Lord has dealt with your heart tonight. I want you to obey Him. Whatever it is He's prompted you to do in your heart, listen to Him and obey Him this evening, will you? Father in heaven, thank you for speaking to our hearts tonight. Thank you, Lord, for... These who are sensitive to you, listening to the Holy Spirit. And I pray, God, that 
you would seal these decisions now as we bow before thee around the altar. Hear our prayer tonight, Lord. May holy decisions be made for you that will affect us both now and for eternity. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this evening, will you? Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Through death into life everlasting, he passed and we follow him there. Over us sin no more hath dominion, for more than conquerors we are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Look this way for a minute. Now listen, if you ever have to leave Bible Baptist Church, go to another Baptist church. You know, I grew up in a church and up in north of here. There were times through the years I've heard people, oh, they don't go here anymore. Where are they going? Oh, they're here at First Christian. What? Uh, they're over here at this non-denominational place. What? How can that happen? Aren't you a Baptist? Aren't you a Baptist by conviction? I mean, you can go to a church that may teach you have to be baptized to go to heaven. How can you go there? Oh, they got good children's programs. Is that why you join a church? I don't know. You ready for sermon number two? Uh, I know some of you are thinking, oh, no, here he goes. No, I won't. But do you understand? Does that make sense? Man, just, just be a Baptist. I don't want you to leave. I don't, anybody, I don't know if I want anybody to go. I mean, I want you to go home tonight, but I want you to go home for good, you know. So that may be in question, too, but uh, just... Man, know what you believe and be, be solid in what you believe. We are, we are Baptist. I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not ashamed to say that. I know the day when a lot of people are taking it off their name and trying to let people know they're, they're not Baptist. I'm a Baptist. I'll tell you I'm a Baptist. Uh, that goes, goes back quite a ways. And uh, I'm glad it does. Amen. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for a wonderful day today. Thank you for... A good day in the house of the Lord. Thank you for decisions that have been made for you. Thank you for faithful people to be in church Sunday morning and Sunday night. Pray your blessing now upon us as we go. Lord, I pray that you'll make us mindful of your presence as we leave this place. May others see Christ in us this week. Help us to walk with you. Help us, Lord, to be followers of Jesus Christ. It's in your precious name we ask it. Amen. Yeah. Amen. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. If you're uh, on the missions trip from Mexico, you can go ahead and slip out while we're singing this song. And make your way down to the conference room, all right? Hey, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go for. It's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below it's the grandest thing to be a christian it's the best thing i know god bless you you are dismissed <laughs>